Uh, he's a physician with UBC and going to be speaking this morning about um, a human case of tick paralysis. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Sylvain Lothar. I'm an infectious disease fellow. I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak about this case. So this is a really interesting, exciting case that we saw late this spring at Vancouver General Hospital, and I'll just sort of take you through it. So this was an 83-year-old, uh, very robust, very healthy Dutch man who um, lived independently and was totally healthy at baseline and he basically presented with a five-day history of numbness and tingling that first started on his palate in his mouth. Eventually over a few hours progressed to his fingertips and the toes. Eventually this really over the next couple of days became very progressive and he became quite clumsy. Initially he wasn't able to sort of control his arms in space. That progressed to involve his legs as well to the point where he was crawling around his apartment. He still didn't think it was prudent to call anyone for help. So he proceeded to crawl around his apartment for about a day and he was quite weak at that point and finally called the ambulance and presented to Lionsgate Hospital. Um, when you talk to him a little bit more about other symptoms, he was experiencing quite severe double vision. Um, his eyes were not really moving in a coordinated fashion. Uh, he had really severe dysarthria, very slurred speech. It was difficult to understand him at all. Um, but other than that, he really didn't have any other symptoms. It was just purely neurological. He didn't complain of any fevers. He didn't complain of confusion or headache or uh, fuzziness in his brain. Um, he didn't have any sort of other infectious symptoms, no diarrhea. And um, of note, all of these symptoms started about eight days after he returned from his cabin. We'll get into that a little bit more. Other medical history, he was totally, like he was a pretty healthy guy, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and he had had a surgery on his heart in the past. Uh, he was on some cardiac medications for many years, but no changes recently. When you did a review of exposures, he had been active at his cabin. Uh, he was just opening it up for the spring, so he'd been collecting some firewood outside. He didn't think he had any insect bites that he could notice, uh, no animal bites, and he had no exposure to insecticides. Other that, than that, he had no travel, he lives alone. He's independent and highly active, no suspicious foods, no new sexual activities, and no substances of abuse. This is where his cabin is. It's up in the Thompson Nicola region of uh, BC, near Cache Creek, so you can see Vancouver's here, and his cabin is up there. I'm told it's about four hours away from here. I've never been there. I'm not from BC, so I've never been there. But, um, when you examined him, he, his vital signs were totally stable. He was afebrile. He had normal mentation. He knew where he was. He was totally appropriate. Um, he had very severe dysarthria, as mentioned. He had nystagmus bilaterally, as well as diplopia with uh, eye, extraocular eye motions. His pupils were normal, and the rest of the cranial nerves were normal. He had no reflexes anywhere in his body. Um, he had very severe weakness, both distal and proximally in all muscle groups, and very severe dysmetria with coordination. Um, the remainder of the examination was unremarkable. The initial studies done at Lionsgate were, were entirely normal, including a CT scan of his head that was normal. So at Lionsgate, neurology was consulted. They thought maybe there was a stroke going on, but because of the symmetrical nature of his neurologic symptoms, it was felt unlikely and it was felt some se severe neurologic thing was happening. So he was transferred to VGH and he was admitted under neurology. And um, we were consulted uh, for potential infectious reason for this uh, presentation. Um, I'll just pause there. Is there any questions up front right now about any more history you'd like or anything you're considering? I think the diagnosis was in the title of this presentation, so we'll just move on. So this, this was our differential diagnosis when we first saw the patient. Neurology was quite convinced that this was actually Guillain-Barre syndrome, and uh, they were preparing him to go for an MRI scan as well as a lumbar puncture, and they had ordered him some IVIG to treat him for Guillain-Barre. Uh, we thought of these other things like botulism, tick paralysis, uh, Lyme disease, maybe diphtheria, although we don't see that very much these days, and maybe some environmental toxin uh, poisoning. 
So nonetheless, neurology decided to do a lumbar puncture and rolled the patient over on his side. And a neurology resident who had just been rotating on the ID service texted us this picture that she found when she rolled the patient over. So the patient was rolled over and, and they found this. And they weren't quite sure what that was, but they figured some ID doctor might know what that is. So they texted us and we said, maybe we should get involved with this case. So you can see there that there's a tick, and this is sort of the mouth, the attachment site, and there's some surrounding erythema there. And you can see the tick is quite enlarged, which makes us suspicious that it's probably been adherent for a number of days. So that changed our differential diagnosis a little bit. So I think Yambare, although can present similarly, uh, was a little bit lower on the list. Botulism, low on the list. Tick paralysis, very high on the list. Lyme disease, uh, neuro Lyme disease, like uh, not very likely. Um, diphtheria, unlikely. I just threw that in there because it's probably not that. So they did the LP anyways, and the LP was normal. And uh, we further sent the tick. The tick was removed with uh, using tweezers and sent uh, to the BCCDC uh, ZEP lab. And this is the pictures from stereotactic microscopy. Uh, this is a zoom in if you're into Halloween-y type things. <laughs> Um, you can see this is the mouth there, and this is sort of the attachment site to the skin. And so the CDC helped us with the identification of this tick, and it ended up being a Dermacenter andersoni. And so just a little bit about the Dermacenter andersoni, or the Rocky Mountain Wood tick. Um, so it goes through three feedings throughout its life cycle. The last feed is on large mammals or humans. Um, their appearance are kind of reddish brown with a white shield, which is highlighted there. Um, and they tend to attach to the skin and feed, and they can swell up quite a bit from their baseline. As you can see in the picture, they can swell up to the size of a swollen raisin. In our case, it was probably larger than a swollen raisin. It was about a centimeter uh, large. And then eventually, they just fall off and lay their eggs. They can be quite uh, cumbersome for humans. They can harbor different infectious diseases like Rocky Mountain spotted fever, tularemia, and Colorado tick fever. Um, this is sort of just a review of the different tick species that we may be exposed to and their different uh, appearances. And so um, I'm certainly not an expert at identifying these things by looking at them, uh, but our excellent ZEP lab at the CDC um, is really good at it, so we thank them for that. Um, so just back to the case a little bit. So we saw this patient and made a diagnosis of tick paralysis on clinical basis. Uh, we asked them to please hold off on giving any IVIG and doing any other further scans. We uh, removed the tick, and within just 30 minutes of removing the tick, the patient felt remarkably better. I went back to the bedside two hours later. He had a fully clear speech before you could barely hear what he was saying, and his reflexes had returned within only two hours. And then by the end of the like two or three days later, he was completely walking around the ward, completely back to his baseline in terms of neurologic recovery, and he was discharged home with a very good outcome. So just a review of tick paralysis. So tick paralysis is, is a toxin-mediated neurotoxidrome, and it's basically, it happens from injection of tick salivary toxins into the skin. Ticks are very smart individuals, and so they've developed this mechanism to sort of anesthetize the skin so we don't feel them bite and suck on our blood, and so we don't pick them off. And so over time, that toxin can accumulate in the blood and cause uh, neurologic symptoms. In terms of different tick species that are capable of producing this syndrome, in BC and the Western uh, Pacific United States, it's predominantly Dermacenter andersoni that does this. There are different tick species in the southeastern U.S. Dermacenter variabilis is the most culprit there. And this is a very common disease in, in Australia, particularly eastern Australia, and it's caused by Ixoides ho uh, holocyclus. And in fact, it's so common there, I think emergency room doctors are really, really good at recognizing this syndrome, and they look on ticks for anyone that presents with neurologic symptoms, and they just pick the tick off and, and sort of prevent all these 2017 expensive, expensive fancy tests to be performed. Um, tick paralysis is most common in the spring and summertime, which is when ticks are more active in feeding. Um, the syndrome is more prevalent in women and children, and that's probably because the ticks hide in long hair and skin folds and hard to reach uh, areas. Um, they predominantly attach to the head and scalp where they can hide out. 
Um, symptom onset of neurologic symptoms, typically this tick has to be feeding for four to seven days prior to the onset of any symptoms. And progression of paralysis happens very, very quickly, on average about a day and a half until you're paralyzed, uh, but it can vary from one to 10 days depending on the individual. It can also start with some malaise and fatigue and kind of nonspecific symptoms, and eventually you get progressive deficits until uh, you're paralyzed, including respiratory failure in rare cases. Key neurological findings are paresthesias are a very common early presentation. Uh, you can get diplopia, dysphagia, and dysarthria that can mimic stroke. Uh, you can get ataxia of the arms and legs and ascending weakness, and all of these things can sort of uh, mimic Guillain-Barre syndrome as well, and there's good literature that suggests that um, Guillain-Barre syndrome is, is the most likely misdiagnosis for tick paralysis. There's usually absence of fever, all of your workup, blood tests, CSF, CT scan, MRI, everything is normal, and the diagnosis is essentially made by the rapid reversal of symptoms when you take the tick off. The treatment is to take the tick off. There's nothing fancy about it. And then the other thing is that the mean recovery time is within about a day and a half. Uh, and often, when you see this syndrome in kids, they can be back to normal within two hours and go home from the emergency department. They don't even need to be admitted. So it's quite rapid reversal. Um, there's a study in the 80s from The Lancet that showed which ways to best remove a tick. This, these are all wrong ways to remove a tick. Um, so the, the most simple method is just to take the tick off using tweezers. You want to sort of target the mouth. You don't want to twist. You just want to sort of pull gently and then obviously, uh, you know, wash the skin and wash the area afterwards and wash your hands. There's all kinds of fancy devices if you wish. You could go to Mountain Equipment Co-op and buy these things, um, but tweezers will do the job. So in conclusion, tick paralysis happens in BC. We just saw a case. There was recently a case at Children's last year that was actually diagnosed on an MRI scan. Uh, the MRI of the brain was done, which found a tick on the skin of the <laughs> child. And so it sort of emphasizes uh, we should be taking good histories when we talk to our patients. If there is a history of exposure to wooded areas or sort of bushy areas, um, and there's neurologic symptoms, we should think about tick disease, and we should do proper dermatologic examinations and try and save taxpayers' dollars by doing all these things. And then improvement is very rapid following tick removal. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, Dr. Morshed and the ZEP lab at the CDC that were involved in this case in identifying the tick, and also Dr. Bill Bowie, uh, who is our clinician, who made the diagnosis, I think, just by listening to the questions I was asking over the phone. He made the diagnosis right away. Um, so thanks very much, and I'd take any questions. Questions? Anyone besides Helen? Yes, Helani. You had your turn, Helen. It's nice to share. Hi, Eleni Galanis with the BCCDC. I wasn't aware of this disease until last year when uh, we were uh, asked to consult on the, the pediatric case. And uh, it strikes me how uh, low the awareness is among clinicians and, and the medical and public health community in British Columbia. So we've done some work, Morshid and I, to try and increase that through website page development. And I think he's written a, a paper which will be published shortly. Where's Morshid? Yeah, we, we just published this case in CMAJ. It just, so, it just came out last week. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So what else would you recommend we do so that British Columbia clinicians and public health communities are more aware and, uh, and avoid delays in diagnosis in the future? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. So the actual incidence uh, of this disease is not really known because it's not a reportable uh, tick sort of transmitted disease. So we don't know the true incidence. I think it's still quite rare for it to occur in BC. Um, you know, obviously the implications are quite severe, so these people prevent, uh, present with severe manifestations of disease. Often the diagnosis is delayed, and often people overreact by over-investigating them, so I think it's important for us to get awareness out there. I don't know how much energy or money we need to spend in, in putting that message across, because I don't know how common it is. Um, but I think doing things like this and publishing things in the literature, um, talking about these things at symposiums like this and trying to educate our colleagues is an important sort of approach, yeah, for sure. Here. Hello, thank you, Sylvan. That was a fascinating case. I'm Emma Turner, I'm a veterinarian with 
IDEX laboratories. And I'm just curious, you mentioned the salivary toxins. Um, are they limited to those three tick species and why is that? Yeah, so um, there, is, there is about 20, if not a little bit more than 20 species of ticks that are capable of, uh, of, of doing tick paralysis, um, both in humans and in animals. And so it's not just exclusively those three tick species. There's at least 20 that are capable of doing it. Um, the actual mechanism by which this happens is not fully known. The tick paralysis is sort of a sodium blockade type of mechanism, but there's obviously sort of a critical threshold because most people that have the ticks on them don't present with any uh, illness at all. So it's probably a dose dependent thing that's also time dependent based on the injection. Um, so, so the full pathophysiology and mechanism is not really known, um, but certainly more than one tick species is capable of uh, doing this illness, yeah. And the last comment will go to Morshed, who was involved, I guess, in uh, identifying the tick. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for a nice presentation. I just uh, don't have a question, just comment. Uh, at BCCDC, we are actually seeing these tick paralysis uh, uh, ticks. The tick comes to us for ID, and then diagnosis was written by the physician, the tick paralysis. And in fact, that we collated all those information for the last 15 years. And recently, it has been published. It's kind of uh, you publication at this point is so not in the hard copy yet, but if you go to the PubMed, so we uh, reported about over 60 cases over 15 years, and most of them from interior uh, BC, and is involved almost more than 80 percent at Dharma Center. But there are few other like Angustus and Pacificus. So um, I think that all ticks they do carry toxin, and they have some. They can make some damage, especially small children and small ruminants. So I think that, uh, but I'm sure that many, many of those cases are not being diagnosed uh, or overlooked. Uh, but if it follow up, then as you said, that uh, then patient or the animal will get better. But sometimes it has fatal consequences as well. Thank you. In the spirit of uh, Helen, <laughs> you do not have the mic. Sit down, please. So, Helen, I'm begging you. In the interior, for example, Douglas Lake Ranch, where cattle are put on in the spring, and all of them will go down. So it's very well known in, in cattle production areas, and we see tick paralysis in wildlife too. I'm just saying that it's not that uncommon, but I think a lot of people are just know about it and treat their animals, and the disease goes away. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Helen. Like Sit down. <laughs> That was Dr. Helen Schwantje, BC's wildlife veterinarian, who will be being escorted out of the room by security. Kirsten, can you call him? Good. Sylvain, thank you very much. Thank you. And 